Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Vincent Lau. I'm a critical care fellow at Western University in London, Ontario. I'm co-authoring with Dr. Robert Arnfield a point of care ultrasound hemodynamic series to help out uh, the ultrasonographer and the critical care physician uh, to better understand advanced hemodynamics in a critically ill patient. Uh, we'll be starting out with our first case of uh, hypolevemic shock. So as a primer, please visit the Western Sono dossier website to review the screencast done by Dr. Robert Arnfield on stroke volume assessment and stroke volume determination prior to delving into this hemodynamic series. Uh, the series will actually uh, require you to have some uh, knowledge of uh, stroke volume assessment acquisition, the uh, arithmetic that's involved in cardiac output uh, determination prior to um, delving into the series. So we present to you a case of hypotension in the PACU, the post-anesthesia care unit of a female with status post renal and pancreatic transplant secondary to type 1 diabetes. Uh, the patient had a dilated cardiomyopathy idiopathic with clean coronaries with a CHF EF of 30% uh, pre-op. Intraoperatively, she lost about 3 liters of blood. That was estimated by anesthesia and urology and was replaced one to one with three liters of crystal light interop. In the PACU, the patient was still hypotense with a systolic pressure of 80, despite a uh, norepinephrine drip of uh, eight uh, mics per minute and a heart rate of 70s to 80s. She sat at about 95% on four liters uh, of O2 and uh, respiratory wise had a rest rate of 28. Her lactate was elevated at 3.4. So the questions that were asked to the ICU as well as to the ultrasonographer who did her echo was undifferentiated shock. Was it primarily still hypovolemic shock, secondary to intraoperative blood loss? Or was there a cardio cardiogenic component as well, given that the patient had a known LVEF of about 30% pre-op? The concern was is that if we were going to give her more fluids, uh, would this be safe given that she has a previous known cardiomyopathy? So further on this case, we'll show you the images that were acquired by the point of care ultrasound. So in these lung fields, it shows that the left anterior axillary line shows primarily an A-line pattern with reverberation artifact down from the uh, pleural line. The patient also had this bilaterally, indicating uh, A-lines and dry lungs, and the patient had no consolidations or pleural effusions to note. And as we know, uh, based on Lichtenstein et al's work, that the, an A-line pattern has a highly predictive 90% uh, specificity of uh, low uh, left atrial pressures, less than 30 millimeters of mercury, uh, as compared to a Swanscan's catheter uh, PA uh, uh, capillary wedge pressure. And that we know that based on this, that it's an A-line pattern, the dry lungs, and that the patient does not have any CHF at this time with low um, left atrial pressures, not in keeping with left atrial hypertension. And looking at the TD echo, we see a peristernal long axis view with no obvious pericardial fusion. Playing the clip, the patient has a normal hyperdynamic LVF, which is different than pre-op of 30%. The patient also has a color which shows uh, no obvious AI and no obvious MR in this view. The patient also has a peristernal short axis view, which shows the hyperdynamicism again with the uh, uh, collapsing uh, LV cavity. The IVC looks flat, uh, measures out to be 0.6 centimeters in size with uh, only minimal uh, respiratory variation at this time. And just for posterity, the patient also has a view of the aorta uh, to compare to the IVC, which is up here. So in summary, it looks like we have a, a patient uh, post-op uh, pancreatic and uh, renal transplant which has a hypovolemic shock uh, on 2D imaging with a hyperdynamic LVF, uh, A-line pattern lung which uh, could accept more fluid in IVC that uh, determines the patient's still hypovolemic. So the treatment for this patient will primarily be IV fluids. So do we really need any more information? Why is this a starting point for our POCUS hemodynamic series? Well, we just wanted to point out a couple things in regards to delving deeper into Hubert dynamics. And we want to start out with a case that will show uh, discrepant 2D echo findings with normal ejection fraction, which doesn't necessarily equate to a normal stroke volume. And we just wanted to show you that uh, even despite the fact that we don't have a Swan-Gans catheter, that we can calculate stroke volume and cardiac output in this patient. So looking at the apical four chamber view, we see the patient has a preserved left ejection fraction as uh, mentioned before. Uh, patient has a right side, which is normal size and function. And we see an apical five chamber with a, a sneaking view of the aortic valve. We're gonna throw some color over top. We see the LVOT through the blue jet and we're gonna do a pulse wave VTI overcrop of it. 
So as we can see here, we're just throwing the equal uh, sign uh, pulse wave Doppler right over the uh, LVOT, and uh, we see that uh, the VTI is only 13.5 centimeters. So again, with a preserved left ejection fraction, we expect, expect a VTI of uh, approximately 18 to 20, uh, indicating an, a normal stroke volume. So we know this patient's hypovolemic, IA lines and uh, IVC flat, so this patient is underfilled at this time. Uh, we then uh, put this into the calculation with a heart rate of 108 and an LBOT diameter of 2.22 centimeters, and we uh, calculate out a cardiac output uh, at 5.6 liters per minute. So again, this is better elucidated on the westernsono.ca website uh, with uh, Dr. Arnfeld's stroke volume determination uh, podcast. Uh, but then I uh, just wanted to show you the math uh, here uh, plugged in that shows that the stroke volume is only 52.2 cc's per beat and uh, below the normal of 60 cc's per beat. And then we get that calculated cardiac output with stroke volume times heart rate of 5.6 liters per minute. So the key take home message we want you guys to come away with is that yes, there can be discrepancy between left ventricular ejection fraction and that you can still have a shock state with low stroke volume, uh, despite the fact that the um, echo findings 2D otherwise can be reassuring. Uh, if we play this clip here, again, this patient had a hyperdynamic LVEF. However, if we looked at uh, under the hood and we looked at the true stroke volume in VTI that it was uh, uh, 13.5 centimeters and below what we would expect for a normal stroke volume. In the resuscitative uh, scenario, whether it's in the eMERGE or the ICU, we care more about stroke volume than we uh, do about uh, left ventricular ejection fraction. So we don't want to be falsely uh, reassured with um, preserved LVEF. Uh, instead, uh, maybe look under the hood and look at the, what the VTI could be. And again, the applications for VTI is that we can ca calculate the stroke volume from that and we can calculate the cardiac output uh, without the use of a Swanscans catheter. So that is a, a very important tool we can have as a non-invasive means of uh, figuring out uh, what uh, somebody's uh, overall hemodynamics are. So again, in, case, uh, in terms of case resolution, this uh, female in hypovolemic shock post uh, renal and pancreatic transplant after uh, blood loss in the OR received uh, two liters of uh, ringers uh, and uh, albumin combined and was eventually weaned off her eight micrograms of uh, levofed uh, norepinephrine and uh, sent up to the urology ward. So good resolution to this case without requiring ICU admission. So again, thank you for joining us for this uh, POCUS hemodynamics series. There will be more in the series uh, with more complexity and more cases as time goes along. Please review uh, Dr. Arnfeld's so westernsano.ca stroke volume determination uh, podcast prior to delving further into the uh, hemodynamics series. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks very much.